All right, well, maybe we'll go ahead and get Hi, started. <laughs> um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here to help us launch Nate Hawk's new book, uh, into the air and and watch it take wing. Um, we are going to um, mix it up today and uh, Nate and I are going to um, talk and he's going to read poems and we'll talk and he'll read poems. Um, I'll just say a quick word about his many accomplishments um, and I'll, I'll try to keep it brief, um, but they are, they are many. Um, Nate Hawk's most recent book, which we are celebrating tonight um, is Nests in Air, which uh, was just published this year by Black Ocean Press. His earlier books include uh, Reveille, winner of the Salt, of Salt Publishing's Crash Out Prize, The Narrow Circle, which won the National Poetry Series, and the chapbook Moony Days of Being, which won the Tomas Salamun Prize. He's also an accomplished translator and has published translations of work by Vicente Huidobro, Christian Dautremont, Henri Michaud, and has written book reviews and essays that have appeared in journals such as the Colorado Review and the Writer's Chronicle. In 2018, he was the poet in residence at the Tomas Salomon Poetry Center in Ljubljana, which I'm really curious to hear all about. Um, and he's held residences as well at the Vermont Studio Center, the Malay Con Con uh, excuse me, Colony for the Arts. Nate is also a sometime editor um, for Convulsive Editions and where he does letterpress printing as well. So he um, wears many hats in the world of literary making. Um, so welcome, Nate. Congratulations on this beautiful, beautiful publication with this gorgeous cover, um, this mesmerizing, compelling, moving book. <laughs> I don't think so. Aha. Wow. All right. <laughs> that was true. <laughs> um, so uh, why don't we start off? I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll invite you to start reading from the book and, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Eager to hear you read. And All right. A warm welcome for Nate. Virtual applause. <laughs> Thanks. That was trippy. That was like the the synesthetic cover was generating some strange sound um anyway all right uh thanks everyone for for logging in and it's such a trip to see people from everywhere um all over the place and from many different times in my life i'm flattered uh, i really sincerely am um and thank you to rachel for for doing this with me um, um in conversation i'm excited about that component mm -hmm. Uh, I think Rachel and I decided I'd sort of read, uh, the book has three parts in it. And so I'd read a little bit from the first part and then we'd talk a little bit. And then the second part, talk a little bit, third part, talk a little bit. And if y'all have questions you, you want to ask, just fire those into the chat, right? All right. So um, <clears throat> this book has uh, little, uh, little suites of pictures um, in it. And I'm gonna, uh, screen share a slideshow of of these pictures, <clears throat> uh, so you don't have to look at me and my luminously shiny bald head um, uh, as I read. And you you can see these pictures. Um, we can talk about the pictures later, but I'll just have this. I'll just have this um, <clears throat> screen sh this slideshow uh, playing, and uh, and we'll let the pictures uh, go from there. So. Let's see here now. Okay. I'm gonna read the first poem. So you guys see the, the picture? Is that right? Thumbs up? Okay, thanks. <clears throat> Nests and air. The light gray bird flies across the fence, flummoxes the squirrel and cordons off the yard. It flies into the office and enters the sentence I was writing about a bird that lacks ambition, but understands the glimmer of the safety pins because its eyes are made of needles. The bird up chucks a fetus because like all birds, its body is pain's whistling vehicle. It shimmers on the bookshelf, whistles a fight song and pecks at the family portraits before building a nest with their radioactive scraps. What is it thinking? What does it want? Can it 
hatch offspring in this fucked up sludge fest? What is the bird's mood? Is it an apricot? Masculine, feminine, feminine, masculine, militant, militant fruit, fiery fruit, bursting flesh, a fire opening in the sun, a sun burning a crush. Where can it leave its brood? In sludge, rotten fruit, in radioactive scraps? When the bird flies back to the window, the window becomes its song and its nest and its throat of blood. <clears throat> it launches a neighborhood protection program and from the rose bush, it assembles the self as a man of thorns, a big cop whose head is congested. So he pistol whips himself until the enhanced interrogation launches his brains into the sky where the bloody pieces become a droning swarm blocking out the moonlight, bloodying the sunlight, drowning the bird songs, clogging throats, clustering around the gray bird and ushering its clusters to the wiry nest, the cradle that hums the scraps of air. <clears throat> I'll read a slightly chiller poem now. <laughs> uh, this poem this poem is called Toy Cloud. The rabbit has stolen the big bear's pointy red hat. The frog looks longingly at its evaporating pond. A powerful glow comes off the sunflower, so everyone wears goggles. My son rolls around in the ferns. It seems he has overdosed on sugar cookies. Does he care about the bear's hat? To him, I am a ghost on a bicycle. I remember my father's mouth reading aloud beneath his beard. He is hiding in my face. The toy cloud is filled with rain. <clears throat> All right, and I'll read one more from the, the first section. Um, this one is uh, called A Paper Father's Nest. What if I were a father and all my children were vomiting paper? Would I write a poem on their paper? Or would I take them in for an x-ray? And would the doctor suspect me of negligence? Would they call child services? Would I need to kill the doctor to save my children? Would I have to torch the hospital and kidnap the nurses? What if the children liked their vomit paper? What if they tried to live with it, kept it in plastic boxes under the bed, colored it and cut circles and squares out of it? What if I were the father of a million particles of paper? What if I inseminated a paper mill and the whole valley were flooded in papery pulp? What if I drank the pulp? What if it stimulated my melatonin? What if I fell asleep under a blanket of pulp? What if when I woke up, a dove flew out of my mouth? What if I captured the dove and sewed him into the quilt? What if I covered my children with the quilt? Would they stay warm? Would they dream of the papery dove? Would they know the dove was their father flying through their heads? <clears throat> okay, we'll take, a, take, a, take a pause there. I think I'll stop the sharing uh, for a minute. <laughs> Nate, that was awesome. <laughs> I have to ask you just first off about the images because they're they're hitting me afresh yeah. and differently in color and with the slideshow format from the beautiful images that appear in the book in black and white, right? Um, and there's there's like, can you tell us how did you choose these? They have amazing captions. I have like thirty seven questions about these images. <laughs> thirty seven questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 36 pictures. So that's like a pretty good, <laughs> that's pretty good rate ratio. Well, okay. So um, my last book, The Narrow Circle also has a similar system where there's like a few poems and then, and then a spread of four pictures. Um, and it's a very similar, it's arranged in a almost identical fashion. And it was something I, I kind of came up with in writing that book. Um, almost on a whim, uh, that book 
that book has sort of two halves. That book has like a half that's called the interior and a half that's called the exterior. And I was kind of thinking like, I don't know, like William Blake, William Blake's one of my favorite poets. And he had this whole system of contraries, you know, in a sense, experience, et cetera, et cetera. And so I was thinking like that. And one of my friends, when he looked at the manuscript said, well, you should, you know, put images in it like Blake, you know, Blake was also a visual artist. And I thought, well, that's a great idea, but I'm not a visual artist. <laughs> so, um, so I did what all, all of us do in our times of desperation. Uh, and I turned to uh, the internet <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and started to call together um, pictures that I thought uh, had resonances with, with certain poems or certain images or, or, or ideas from poems. Um, and with this book, it was a very similar process. Uh, I didn't, I thought it would be a one-off with the narrow circle <clears throat> and, 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 it, and it was like, it worked there and I was happy with it. Um, and I was like, all right, that's cool. I did that and then we'll do it again. And then, and then with this book, you know, it was just after I had completed the manuscript, it sat, it sat around for a year or so. And I thought, mm, maybe I'll just try it and see. One reason I liked doing it was because it, it, it actually was like a way to revise the book. The, the, mm. the images I found kind of told me what the poems were doing in another way. They gave me another way of like feeling about and thinking about the poems. And so based on the images I was finding, I would kind of decide, oh, that poem maybe just doesn't fit. Or based on the sequence of images, I would feel like, oh, this works really well, this sequence. And the images are sequenced with the poems. Um, mm -hmm. So it... it so when I started doing it and I felt like there was the same kind of resonance that I felt with the narrow circle, I felt like, okay, okay well, I'll, I'll try it again and, and see how it goes. Um, the one difference was for this book, I, I limited myself to um, work that was shared in the public domain with a, a, a explicit Creative Commons license yeah. uh, because I got, it was such a pain with the other book to get. <laughs> <laughs> to get licensing and stuff like that. Um, I mean, it was fine in the end, but it was just like a whole other hurl, you know, to, 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 to leap over. I don't know if that answers your question. About them, it though. does, it <laughs> does. You know, I noticed that the, so the captions are all taken, each mm. photo has one mm. line and they're taken from the poems in order, right? Yeah. Um, and it just has this powerfully um, highlighting effect <laughs> on certain aspects of the poem. So I'm really fascinated to hear you say that it was a way to revise and to like rethink the poems. Um, and there's a kind of humor in here too. Yeah. No, I mean, I don't know if I, if people can see if I, should, you know, but this one says, um, when I crinkle the newspaper, and this is the image we get. Yeah, well. And then this one says, I pick, peck, peck at the mush, 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 and we get this one. Um, can, can you talk about, about that and how you chose which lines to, to, to highlight? I'm glad you find humor in them. I mean, part of it is like, I feel like sometimes my poems get a little, a little down, they're a little downer, you know, a little heavy. And I and I think I think the pictures hopefully like give you a space to breathe and you know relax a little bit. I mean, I find poetry books to be kind of stuffy sometimes, right? And so the pictures are a way to open that space up a little bit. Um, well, I you know what I would do? I, did you ask how I how I matched them up? So what I would do is like just sort of like zero in on a on a line or a phrase, and and I would Google that phrase. And I uh, from a poem, and I would and I would I would Google or I would I would go into the Wiki image um, bank, the Wiki Commons, right? And I would Google that exact phrase, and then I would kind of think about like, well, what pictures are coming up, and what would be interesting um, as a contrast to that phrase, or as a as as a kind of prolongation, right, of what that what that image or phrase is suggesting. Um, <clears throat> And uh, yeah, I want there to be a playfulness. I want I want there sometimes to to feel like oh, that's literally the glow coming off the sunflower, or no. hmm, that's a that's a strange, weird little you know microscopic picture of a, there's like an enzyme or something in there, you know, and, and feel about how that resonates off some part of the poem. Um, yeah. The okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. there's a lot of organic imagery, right? Uh -huh. And a lot of um spheres a lot of spherical objects i was wondering if that was a coincidence yeah it felt kind of nest like and that was one way i knew that's one way i felt like the book was coming together was like when i would 
when I had the poems in a specific order, and then when I would see that the, the images attached to these poems were, were, were forming like clusters that had similar shapes that felt yeah. to me like a, that felt to me like a way that, that the pictures were composing the book almost, or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. any completion, sense of completion. Um, I want to ask you one other question about um, before we maybe maybe you could read some more poems. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about sort of the um, the choice to write a book that has uh, such a coherence to it in the sense that each poem has nest in the title in some way, right? So there's a there's a real kind of through line, um, with the wonderful exception of Key West instead of Nest in a Wallace Stevens. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, and sort of what that process was like for you in writing the poems and and fitting them together. Sure, I, I'll try my best. Um, I didn't, you know, predetermine uh, this this thing. It was sort of I try to come from the ground up in in my writing, and so I write a bunch of poems and try not to think too hard about what's going on. But then when I start to rework them and revise them and assemble them into a manuscript, I kind of see if they have commonalities. Mm -hmm. And um, I also, when when I, you know, my type of writing, sometimes it's hard to elicit responses from it. And so I've learned um, over time that if I'm just insistent upon some motif or something like that, that then that kind of like steadies readers and audiences like, oh, okay, it keeps coming back to that some, same word. So that's something, right? Even though we don't know what to make of this other weird stuff he's saying, right? Um, and so, yeah, so it seemed like Nest was something that was, you know, provocative and evocative to me. Mm. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, in reworking the poems, I every time I'd rework a poem, I'd think like, how can I get nest into the title, <laughs> right? Does it make sense? Um, and it was a kind of back and forth, uh, back and forth process. Um, the more, the mm -hmm. more the titles bore the nest word, the more the poems themselves uh, mm -hmm. found themselves getting mm -hmm. into that idea and that concept. That's interesting. That elastic kind of connection between the two. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. I want to use the word organic again too. To <laughs> yeah, 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 sort of. Yeah, Dial dialogue kind of back and forth there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, you know, the more the more it became a part of it, the more I got into it, and you know, got really into kind of researching a little bit about different uh, animal nesting habits and uh, reading other nest poetry, like John Clare's beautiful poem. I might read a John Clare poem. Um, I think it's probably useful for anybody who's listening right now and thinking like, how do I put a manuscript together? Like, how do you create coherence to it, right? And it's, it's helpful to hear that it's it's not necessarily a clear cut mm. <laughs> process. There's some moving back and forth. Yep. Um, yeah. Would you read more poems? Please? All right. Yeah. Let's do right. it. Um, so I'll read from the middle section here, and I think, <clears throat> yeah, this one. I'll read a I'll read a John Clare one after uh, after a couple here. So I'll read I'll read um, another poem called Nests and Air, and uh, I'll start there. A new self sensation is brimming inside me. You know that electric bug that crawls up and down the dark window, writing a gooey cursive. Is that a suave anthem? time and space and pronouns flicker. If not for you, a night of sleep would remove them. So what will release me from fraud and air? That the corn has been harvested? That the red ants froze to death? Bugs die, my friend, but in the case I become edible again, I grant you this last jackal kiss shaved with a decelerating arrow in the bathroom below the sleeping owl. <clears throat> I forgot to start the pictures again. Let me let me do that. There's the enzyme. Oh, from the beginning. No, I don't want to start from the beginning. There. Okay. <laughs> pardon, pardon the hiccup. Okay. Uh, next poem. This poem's called the nidus. Nidus in I D U S, which is um, which is a word that we have 
for the site of an of an infection um, where an infection enters uh, the body, for example. But it is it is it is a it is a curious word uh, that comes also, you know, from the the Latin word for nest. Um, um, I find this kind of meaning in the word fascinating. So uh, here's the nidus. I want to step outside my brain, absolve its monologue, and become a small white flower to shade the robin egg that fell to the grass between the shrubs and chain link fence. The doors are locked, the dark windows reflect the alley's light, and from behind the screen, a father becomes a kind of no shape, a reflection in toilet water where the warrior brow flattens out as a bracelet rattles in the bedroom. That self festers in the cellar, a mold spawning colonies of devils who have swallowed the scrolls and digested the passwords. I try to vomit, but what comes out is neither human nor invertebrate. Exoskeletons cannot swim. Okay, last, last one from the book, this, or from this section of the book. The, this is the sparrow's nest, and it is a, a spell for the future and for John Clare. <clears throat> Within my shadow lives a colder shadow, one devoid of vision or form, a dark fountain which reflects my face. And within that face is another face, two eyes, a tongue, a constellation I call my son, an art form that jibber jabbers into the untuned hearing aid, that inroad to the greater hive. And within the hive is a maze of chambers housing more sons and daughters and mahogany bureaus and pleated accordion drapes. Behind the drapes are my daughter's daughters who carry earthworms from the garden and sing and breathe and belch. Soon they'll wear lipstick and give birth maybe to twins and I'll wash my hands before holding the babies. And beneath the soap dish is the shadow soap dish, the oil, the grime, the slippery outline that haunts the soap and the twisty timeline ghost writing through me. And inside the slippery outline, I exhaust my homilies at home, within the home, within the shady leaves. <clears throat> um, yeah, so that, that one's called a spare. So John Clare, I just want to read a poem by John Clare because he's sort of one of the one of the many guiding spirits of the book. Um, uh, John Clare, if, if, if some of you probably know, maybe not some of you don't, was an English poet uh, of the Romantic era. Um, I'm going to stop the share. John Clare might not want my, my pictures with his poem um, of the Romantic era. Uh, and uh, he uh, wrote a lot of different kinds of poems, but he, he, he wrote many poems about discovering nests, uh, uh, you know, in the countryside and in the farm farm areas that, that, that he that he lived in. And so uh, I'm just going to re read this, this one that I love so much, the squirrel's nest, um, partly because when, 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 when we moved to the house we live in now, um, it was when I was really working on this book quite a bit, there was a tree outside our bedroom window, and it had, and the tree's no longer there, we had to have it removed, but it had, it had, uh, it was, it was a crazy big tree, and right outside the window, where I was, you know, sleeping, uh, was a giant squirrel's nest. And I will always remember sort of waking up the first day in like the new house and ha having these like squirrels running around like crazy, both on the tree and then on the rooftop that the tree was sort of uh, uh, close to. Uh, so I'm going to read, and squirrel's nests are wonderfully messy and, and big and, and kind of crazy. Um, so anyway, I'm going to read the, um, uh, 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 the squirrel's nest. <clears throat> One day, when all the woods were bare and blee, I wandered out to take a pleasant walk and saw a strange formed nest on a stoven tree where startled pigeon buzzed from bouncing hawk. I wondered strangely what the nest could be and thought, for sure, it was some foreign bird. So up I scrambled in the highest glee and my heart jumped at everything that stirred. It was oval shaped, strange wonder filled my breast I hoped to catch the old one on the nest. When something bolted out, I turned to see, and a brown squirrel puttered up the tree. 
'twas lined with moss and leaves, compact and strong. I slithered down and wandering went along. <laughs> so, the squirrel's nest. John Clare. Yeah. So you just read us two, we heard two different poems that were some, what's the best word for this, in dialogue with John Clare in some way. Um, yeah. How would you characterize that dialogue or that relationship? Are you, do you lift lines or phrases or did you let the poems kind of come through you and then write your own poems? What was that process like? Yeah, I mean, with the John Clare one, I think I was reading a whole lot of his his nest sonnets at the time or nest poems and um, he has some, you know, he has one called the Sparrow's Nest. So, so, so I, I can't remember exactly. I may have taken a word or two, but yeah, usually it's sort of like, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I, I, my, my, my poem making process involves often sort of grabbing a word from here, grabbing a word from there mm -hmm. and, and, and whatever texts I'm engaging with, you know, at, at the moment um, will kind of find their ways into and out of the poems in, in different shapes and forms. Um, I, you know, like I try to use that analogy. It's kind of maybe kind of corny, but it's a little bit like making a nest and kind of taking some material from here and taking material from here and swirling it all together um, into, into some kind of coherent whole. <laughs> Great. I love that. I love that. That's like a, yeah, that, that'll be our go-to phrase now for how that process happens. Like forget pounds, you know, magpie thing and <laughs> Nate's nests. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested to hear that because you know, I was really made curious by this brief note in the acknowledgments. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It seemed like a kind of teaser where um, you mention uh, how did you put it? Uh, several poems borrow scraps from and or are dial in dialogue with mm -hmm. uh, work from as poets as various as Guillaume Apollinaire and Gwendolyn Brooks, mm -hmm. um, Elliot Hopkins. We also have Deleuze and Guattari in there, um, Bernadette Mayer. Ridiculous, right? Um, so, you know, so, <laughs> yeah. so you know what, you know, was there a system to it? Was it a, a matter of, as you say, in all of those cases, kind of pulling bits and building yeah. your mess out of them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The system, the system is is not. It's very systematic. Um, it's sort of like these are the things I was reading and uh, and and thinking about um, at the at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, but there are there are examples. I think I think you know. I'm going to read this one, which which is really you. If you know the if you know the Stevens poem, the idea of order at Key West, you can you can hear really explicit phrases that come out of that. Um, and that's kind of what it's like, but this one is way more explicit in so far as it's deliberately trying to sig signal that poem um, and not just use the use the scraps as like raw material to generate something new. Um, yeah. You know, so I think that might be a better um, a better example. Um, um yeah, I'm I'm glad you're going to read that poem. I love that poem. <laughs> um, um, just to go back to nests again, you you were just saying a few minutes ago that it just the image of the nest seemed especially evocative um, in some way, and it's you know it seems um, nests in air seems like a precarious thing to me to try to build a home in the middle of this yeah. inhospitable medium right where normally you should be flying or taking wing or passing through you know soaring through air but not necessarily trying to build something that's you know that would be anchor anchored somewhere um uh could you say something about why and how nests were evocative for you well, you... I, I love that phrase, and it comes from a, 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 a poem by Apollonaire, you know, um, and, and, and in his poem, he's, he, he's got the, the phrase as a verb, nidifier en l'air, or something like that. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's what, to me, it's what speech is, right? I mean, it's what we're doing when we're speaking, or having a conversation, or reading a poem aloud. Um, it's this temporary kind of interlocking of consciousness or understanding hopefully right um and uh, 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 uh yeah. and it's there for a while and and like if we're lucky like something comes of it and then it, no matter what it eventually is gone you know um that seems it seems quite it just seems like the way it works right but what you're talking about too i mean it's also the way i feel <laughs> The way, also the way I feel about like being a person in the world and having, you know, 
it won't surprise anyone. I have a family, right? But it, it, it's also the way I feel about like having a, a family. Like there's this, it feels really precarious to yeah. uh, have offspring at, at this time or any time probably. Um, so that kind of sense of it being out there in the air and uh, open to all the currents <laughs> is yeah. part of the problem, right? Yeah. I really, I really uh, picked that up reading the book. I mean, you, you've already read like three poems that have fatherhood or parenting mentioned, right? This is like a recurrent concern. It seems to, you know, I get the feeling of this, um, this desire to, you know, nurture and protect one's offspring, and then that sense of precarity surrounding everywhere. Um, uh, for the folks at home, Nate and I were talking about this book and, you know, I was like, this is a pandemic book, right? You wrote this during the pandemic. Um, you know, there's so much about isolation and um, infection and you read the, the uh, how's it pronounced, nidus poem, I this guess, yeah. nidus poem about, which is a point where infection enters the, you know, bacteria enters the body and, and the word infection comes up over and over again. And I was reading this with pandemic eyes and Nate said, no, I wrote this before the pandemic. <laughs> totally. I mean, yeah. yeah, it was the manuscript was like more or less what what you see by 2016. And so um but I'm so happy that it feels relevant. Uh, <laughs> and uh I think, you know, cuz I think I mean, I think one of the problematic things about having the home, home life and family is like there is something really isolating about it. Mm -hmm. um, at least in the way it's kind of set up and structured uh, in in our country, in the U.S. in, in, in this time. Um, so it can feel uh, like you're in a lockdown, even when you're, <laughs> even if it's not a literal, literal lockdown. Um, yeah. And like I said, I was, I was fascinated by that kind of double, that nidus word and that kind of double sense of a, the nest can be also a point of infection. And of course that, you know, that's related to and anyone who's, you know, where's my friend, my old friend from high school, David, I mean, he's a scientist, science people know, you know, it's like, uh, you don't want things nesting in the wrong place, right? A nest in a tree can be, can be um, like, a, like if, a, if, a, if a bird's nesting in the, in the actual um, trunk of the tree, well, that can, that can be damaging and, and introduce a kind of, a kind of infection of sorts uh, to that, to that mm -hmm. structure. Um, you don't want, birds or rodents nesting in, in, in your house or something like that, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, so. Wasps nesting on my balcony as they currently are, they're yeah, like everywhere in Chicago right now. Oh, maybe yeah. I'll read my wasp nest. Yeah. Yeah. Will you read more poems? Absolutely. Wonderful. Yeah. And right, just so a reminder to the audience, if anybody has a question, please don't hesitate to put it in the chat at any point. Okay. All right. I'll read three or four more. Okay. Um, so here's the so here's the Homer Simpson at Key West poem, and the way I thought about this poem was it's sort of a mashup of the Simpsons, um, and one of my favorite poems, uh, which is by Wallace Stevens, a poem called "The Idea of Order at Key West." Um, and so this this is one where you can really hear like I'm taking I'm borrowing language from from Stevens, um, and then kind of weaving it into some other uh, context. Um, okay, I'm gonna go back to the slideshow. All right, got the scrambled eggs. Those will come. Those will come up soon. Um, <clears throat> but uh, yeah, Homer Simpson at Key West. Egg-eyed Homer Simpson gestures toward the sea. Each hand lacks one finger, for the artist's psychic wounds have manifested themselves in mimetic truncations. Homer thinks the fluttering in his stomach is one of hunger's many waves, but it is merely the off-screen artist's urge to reshape the emblazoned zone, that, that tilting nest wherein sound and image embellish the offspring, their empty sleeves and inhuman cries in acutely, gullied, gu in acutely colored gullies. And although flowers grow all around Springfield, the nuclear plant dumps tons of sludge in the dark gray river where the mutated fish blow vast thought bubbles straight into the filthy water supply pipes. That delicate death rattler, Mr. Burns, has appropriated many sectors of the city's wild space. And even amid the rare botany, Homer's stomach is legendary. 
He once ate 64 slices of American cheese during a sleepless night. But today, the crooked frigate bird he spots on the horizon zigzags like a caretaker's maze. I mean the parents, I mean the parents' conflicted feelings of boredom and responsibility, which even Homer feels. So when you sing to your baby, you are merely shuffling the gasping wind and the sea and a bird's elongated warbles, which we swore we heard at precisely the same time each morning a moment before dawn. Now Homer hears nothing, not the grinding water, not the heaving sky. His ear holes are small, whale-like, and he fears his sleep's wavy information. He drinks another duff, this one pouring straight into his mouth in a rapid column from at least six inches over his head as if some sprite had lifted the can and tilted it at the perfect angle. But of course, it's his son, Bart, whose yellow body is the spirit of impish world-making that infuriates Homer. His wandering from hour to hour in the summer without end means that even the theatrical distances of digesting hamburger might rekindle Marge's magic blue hair, might make the speech acutest song, might enchant the night, that thread between the indifferent overweight father and his children whose keen laughter deepens the sea's color and demarcates the irony of the desire to steal a fishing boat and to set out to return with fish that will become the coins that will buy the family bread. <clears throat> okay. All right, let's let's keep uh, keep with the keep with the fatherly uh, the father theme here. <laughs> uh, a father's work is never done. I'm sorry, this poem has an awful pun in it, and if you remember to ask me, I'll point it out later. You probably spot it. A father's work is never done. Father was tired of gender, so he so he entered a trance and conceived of the Holy Ghost a neuter spirit that would ride alongside him as he drove his dark red Saturn up the mountain of the future. And he drove up the mountain of the future and he deforested most of it to build luxury condos on the Southwest slopes. And he relocated the wolves, which were dear as children to him in zoos so large, the zookeepers were still mapping out the boundaries. Then the Holy Ghost got lost in a pack of storm clouds which was the plan from the beginning. For even in the beginning, father's plans were complex and ineffable. Father's plans were beautiful as scrambled eggs. Father's plans were difficult to digest. And the more we asked about them, the more we felt butter churning in our stomachs. And he devised this plan. In the future, English will be a mustache that slowly leaks hot oil into the mouth. And he devised this plan. We'll stand on our heads and let the ocean wash over us. The ocean will be a tub of mint tea. The ocean will make the sound of a tuba and be filled with manatees. He devised another plan and then took a nap. His nap was a long summer day and in his dream, he conceived new names for his children. And he awoke with a start and let out a yelp when they began clipping his whiskers. They clubbed each other with magic police wands and smeared blood on his Saturn's windshield. It was a homecoming party and they needed to build a nest they needed to crawl back into that monster's mouth. My pictures are stuck. What's happening? Oh, there they go. Whew. Keep going. Okay. <clears throat> All right. And um, let's see here. What's the time? All right. Well, I think I'll just do one more. I think. Either the paper nest or the or the wasp nest. I don't know, Rachel, you you kind of suggested the paper nest. Should I do that one or okay? All right, all right. The paper nest. It's two parts. Part one. The white flag unfurls be below pearly flat clouds. I have stitched its holes with thin synthetic fibers, washed it in hot water, and sprayed it down with hotel grade chlorine so no stains remain. Now it hovers over me, a blank page, or the soundless name for a sniveling people of bird-like fear, 
the unwritten name for a pupil of thin talons and weak bones and crumpled digestive tracts. It is the flapping name for a people of psychotic glowing gadgets, people of daggers, live streaming people, TV people. They flash lightning white teeth and in their dopey eyes, you can read a history of sea salt, of sea hags, burning crosses, large snouted mammals. When I think about their people hair, I want to drink green liquor. And when I think about their people eyes, I want to spit a fruit fly in half. I'm sorry, split a, split a fruit fly in half. Its genetic sequence births a poem so long and boring that when I read it, I feel like a people is shoveling sand into my open skull. Why is my skull open? Is it a holiday? Should I be eating ham? I don't know. I drink the green people drink and this rattling person called I defaces all the people paper. Is this person just my head's over-caffeinated meta-commentator, an oily person voice that describes drinking as a metaphor for reading and reading as a metaphor for people's territorial expansion? It sounds congested. Here, have a Benadryl, depopulate yourself, leave your phosphorescent coin wrapped in Kleenex on the bar and the zinc glows. <clears throat> Two, but the faces, all their orange and blue eyes pop out of the overhanging television. They say, here, drink this bottle of bleach and white out your inner life. Here, massage this penguin oil into your person's scalp. It will help your skull maintain its seedy melon shape and soothe the horse meta-commentator. Swallow this eco-friendly loaf of bread. Dial this rotary phone and confess. Confess everything. Confess all your viper thoughts to the not-so-friendly operator. This call may be monitored and or recorded for quality and training purposes, so don't hold back. Tell us how you're not a person, you're a voice on paper, and you're afraid to turn the page because it's hiding a revolver. Cock it and aim at the person-shaped cloud slouching in your paper meal mirror. Cock it and flog yourself. Interrogate your paper cat. Put your family on notice. They are paper people and paper burns. Cock it and bulldoze your paper people family farm. Dump your radishes in the people river. Tie writhing knots with the snakes in the hayloft. Cock your old papery revolver. Cock it and let its clicking be an endless winter on the filthy, flat, bare, bulldozed family farm. Woohoo! <laughs> that was that was great. That was great to hear you read that out loud. I'm so glad you did. Thank you. <laughs> I think I told you this the other day when we were talking that the first time I read that one aloud, I was wearing an ape costume um, at the at the request of Toby Altman. Uh, you know, that that made a lot of sense to me to be reading in an ape costume. <laughs> And that was part of the absinthe and zygote series where each reading had a different sort of framing yeah right? yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, that's fantastic so um wow um uh yeah wow I love that poem i, I <laughs> it's really great <laughs> you're getting a lot of appreciation in the chat too um i gotta ask you what was the pun i don't think i caught it in the homer simpson okay. US. what was oh, the it was in the it was in the father's plan so the the father one is like sort of like my version oh, oh, of right. cre creation but um but i kind of imagine this this creation father as the kind of father from the the myth of uh chronos which is also saturn i guess in roman right in the latin mm -hmm. um so so this father drives a saturn car <laughs> got it he's the, he's the okay. one who eats his children right and there's there's a there's like yes. this there's this there's this, this amazing amazingly haunting goya image of it where mm. it's just <laughs> one of these one of these poor souls um, it's only fitting for the themes of this book i mean yeah right exactly yeah. <laughs> it's not autobiographical by the way. right 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 <laughs> that clear um uh, yeah, I really, I really love the 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 fatherhood poem, and then also the um, the Homer Simpson at Key West. I mean, you're really channeling. I, I mean, also, I, I caught uh, channeling Stevens, but mm -hmm. I also caught more when you were reading it out loud. The alliteration, that insistent M sound, you know, that comes out near the end of the poem. Yeah, uh, and that poem that poem grew too out of like my love for for the kind of pop realm of like John Ash, you know, I, I teach yeah. often like John Ashbery's uh, Popeye, Sestina, or Daffy Duck in Hollywood, you know, and so I, 
yeah. my poems aren't too poppy. <laughs> There's not a lot of pop culture in my poems, um, but I wanted to try to do that. And I, and I, and I, and I, of course, you know, kid of the eighties and nineties grew up with, with the Simpsons and uh, mm -hmm. the book about, you know, family life and parenting wouldn't be complete for, 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 <laughs> for Gen X without a little Homer Simpson in it. So. Oh, the Simpsons are for all time. I mean, <laughs> you know, they're, they're still running now. It's a <laughs> <I know. laughs> yeah. timeless. So my time. kid, my, my 12 year old's into it. You know, he loves them. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, it's interesting because we've got those kind of pop culture references and then I often feel the kind of presence of um, uh, 20th century French poets who I know you've spent time with, like Michaud, uh, Apollinaire, maybe also Blaise Sondrars. I mean, there's, there's kind of a, um, and you, you're, you're a prolific translator. I, do you feel like uh, your translation work, how does it knit together with your own writing, if it does? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that too directly. I was gonna say though, another another kind of reference point for like the way the pictures are operating. I, I love I love this contemporary French poet Pierre Alfieri. Are you familiar with? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got this great book that's a sequence of, of pictures, uh, picture poems. There's like a picture and then like just a phrase after it. So like you know, I, I kind of was riffing off of something he had done. I think it's called XOX is the name of this book, um, and. Uh, yeah, I don't know. You know, I mean, so much of, of of what I first fell in love with in poetry as a poet was was French poet French poets. Um, you know, the the sort of going from Rambeau into the twentieth century, and then and Spanish poets too. Mm -hmm. um, that that I wouldn't be the poet I am without translation itself. So I mean, this isn't about my work as a translator, but just how important translation is to mm -hmm. how I how I feel and think about poetry itself um so that's 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 just impossible to to get out of but yeah man i love i love translating and it and it and it's um it's 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 this kind of i feel like when i'm translating i'm involved in this ever ever moving target um uh that uh it's, it's actually a nice break from writing my own poems because mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. at least there's a target. Like <laughs> yeah yeah right <laughs> yeah no, I, I really get that. Um, yeah. What, uh, can I ask? So this book was finished in 2016, you said, and then you tinkered a little bit to send it to press. Um, what have you been writing since then? What are you up to now? What's, what's yeah. new? Yeah, so I have some new work, work, work cooking. And, um, you know, the, the residency in Ljubljana was productive. I, I worked with um, uh, Slovenian poets translate that was a really fun translation experience because um I would sit I don't I don't speak Slovenian very well at all but I would sit down with uh, a poet or, or two and their English was very good and it would be sort of translation via conversation right I would sort of talk mm -hmm. through what's going on in their poems and, and work on that so that's that's one thing I've been working on um as as well as translations uh by work by Tristan Zara the, the Dada, Dada poet um some collaborations he did with the Jean Arp that aren't widely available and so I'm working working through that right now um, and yeah awesome. all, these, all these new poems and Jean Arp brings us back to the cover the scene <laughs> that we were talking about this kind of callback it, yeah. so this isn't Jean Arp right but it's a, a kind not, of no it's not Jean Arp but 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 they when they asked me for a kind of description or treatment of how I would what you know reference points for the cover you know I I love um John Arp or Hans Arp, depending on your side of the border. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I love I love his art and the the, the 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 collage nature and the you know he was famous for doing these collages where he would supposedly throw up scraps of paper in the air and then however they'd fall fall down he would um, record that that arrangement and um, create a plate and and print off of that or something like that. Mm -hmm. I just love Arp's work so. Uh, Sort of one of the points of inspiration for the designer did an awesome job yeah oh yeah it's it's beautiful it's so elegant and it does seem to kind of that kind of jibes with what you're saying earlier just about the way that the nest is a kind of process like building the nest letting the scraps mm -hmm. fall and right. see they, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah um 
and having conversations with Slovenian poets and building nests in the air with them. Right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, we have maybe a minute for um, any questions that uh, the audience would like to pose. Um, otherwise, uh, I think we will begin oh, to say uh, bonsoir. bonsoir. <laughs> begin to say good night. Um, I think Starsha has put the link for where to find your book so everybody can get a copy. Maybe I'll uh, put that again just so folks know where to find it. Uh, yep. Um, highly recommended. This is a, a beautiful, absorbing book. Don't miss it. Get your copy. Um, and uh, it has really pretty fly paper as well, by the way. It's a gorgeous object. Um, uh, all right. Well, Nate, thank you so much for, for uh, choosing to launch this collection into the air with us tonight. Thank it's you. It's an honor to get to have a chance to talk with you about it and hear your poems. Well, I, I appreciate um, I appreciate that, and thank you so much for coming along and conversing. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. It's really, really wonderful, flattering to see you all. <laughs> Such a pleasure. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. We'll see you at the next event, and uh, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Starsha, so much for setting us up and making it run smoothly. All right. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye, everybody.